The thing about space, the grand irony of it, is we thought it was all about the vastness. Stretching out beyond comprehension, a chilling testament to our cosmic insignificance. But you work in this business long enough, you realize it's all about the minuscule the tiniest variations, the near misses, the improbable odds that had to align for humanity to ever have a shot. We were a tremor in the cosmos, a blip on the radar. At least, that's what I believed until the day the sun went out. My name is Dr. Elias Camden. Astrogeologist was my official title whatever that means to a civilian. Most folks just called me Space Doc, seeing as I patched up more satellites and probes than astronauts on those long hauls. Never thought that glorified mechanic gig would land me smack dab in the center of the most important discovery in human history. Or, depending on how you look at it, the worst. We always had an obsession with the moon. Maybe it was that primal tug in our bones that recognized the silvery orb for what it was, a force of nature beyond our control. Maybe we would just starve for something new, anything new, out here in the cold expanse where planets blurred together and stars became indistinguishable pinpricks. Whatever the reason, humanity had its eye on the moon since day one of the space program, and we weren't about to stop. That's how I found myself on Lunar Outpost 4, the clumsiest of the off-world colonies we'd built. We tried Mars once, but it turns out colonization sounded way sexier in the history books than it did in practice. Sandstorms, radiation, isolation too much for even the most hardened space veteran to handle. So, we made a compromise, a close-to-home, low-tech outpost just a hop and a skip from good old Earth in case anything went haywire. And wouldn't you know it, something did. I was nearing the end of my year-long shift, starting to dream of real coffee and the smell of grass when it happened. We'd picked up odd seismic activity on the far side of the moon, not enough to cause alarm, mind you. The moon had its share of quakes, remnants of whatever cosmic smash-up had formed the thing in the first place. We were investigating, of course, mostly out of boredom. No one thought it was a big deal. It was supposed to be the most routine mission of the season. Then came the eclipse. Now, don't get me wrong, eclipses are amazing out in space. You get this crystal clear view of the sun's corona, earth a perfect sapphire in the distance, usually, it's a postcard-worthy moment. This one was. Off. At first, it was just an unsettling feeling, like the prickle on the back of your neck when something's just wrong but you can't place why. The darkness, when it finally fell, it felt heavier. Cold, not just in the lack of sunlight way, but something that seeped into your core and whispered this isn't right. Turns out, that gut feeling of mine was dead on. As the light slowly bled back, creeping over the sun's rim, everyone at the outpost scrambled to their telescopes. It was chaos, shouting and cursing, I won't rat anyone out, but Commander Shepard swore up a storm the likes of which you'd expect from a salty old sailor, not an upstanding astronaut. We always knew there was a chance of finding something on the far side of the moon. Some ancient meteor crater, a new mineral deposit. But never this. It was a structure. Not the natural formation kind, carved by wind and rock over millennia. This was angles and plating and lights. Windows that blinked in patterns that made the mathematicians start muttering about Fibonacci sequences and alien transmissions. Within the hour, the conspiracy theorists back on Earth had latched on, and the base, along with the world outside, spiraled into a frenzy. Now, I'm a scientist, not a soldier. I analyze rocks, not the psychological fallout of extraterrestrial contact. Still, even I could see the writing on the wall. This wasn't a relic, a forgotten base built by some forgotten civilization. This thing was enormous, bigger than any city on Earth. It was active. My first thought was awe. See, when you spend your whole life among the stars, you begin to develop a healthy dose of cosmic humility the sheer audacity of it, of some other life form not just managing to survive out there, but to thrive to the point they could build something to dwarf our wildest architectural dreams. Well, it shook you. My second thought, the one I still try to bury when sleep won't come, was something far more primal. Fear, clean and unfiltered. Because as soon as we managed to zoom into whatever windows that structure had, it became clear those weren't lights reflecting back at us. They were eyes. It felt like being locked in a stare-down contest with the universe itself. It didn't blink first. In those early panicked hours, I saw a lot of things in my colleagues. Terror, of course, but also hubris. Our commanders, the puffed-up heroes of the space program, immediately started rattling off protocols ripped from old invasion flicks. Send out probes, attempt contact. A few suggested preemptive strikes, for crying out loud. I guess those brave pioneer types figured if we got wiped out in a blaze of interstellar glory, at least history would remember us as the ones who went down fighting. 
What terrified me most wasn't the prospect of war with an alien species that clearly outgunned us by a light year. It was that look of determination I saw spreading through my fellow humans. The spark of fight or flight that had gotten us to this point, the same instinct that would, with the slightest twist, have us reaching for those bombs instead of a telescope. Were we curious explorers or conquerors? When faced with the unknown, would we greet it with a question, or a challenge? The eclipse lingered longer than any should have. We never got a clear look at what was hiding in the shadow. I have no idea if that was happenstance or intentional design. What I do know is that, eventually, the sun peeked over the edge of that impossible structure and forced it into retreat. We were left in the harsh daylight, a species abruptly aware of our place in the pecking order. Commander Shepard, the eternal optimist, hailed it as a sign of their restraint, maybe even their benevolence. Some folks believed it was a test, that we'd passed by not taking patchots in our blind panic. I wasn't so sure. Maybe they saw a flicker of something in us, the same violence that lurked behind their silent gaze, and decided it was best to give us a wide berth. Or maybe they were just busy and we were the cosmic version of a gnat at a picnic. In the end, the why didn't matter as much as the aftermath. News of the lunar eclipse incident that was its official name, boiled down to an astronomical term, spread like wildfire. There were riots, cults springing up overnight, government officials making speeches filled with promises they couldn't keep. I made the mistake of reading the comment sections on the newsfeeds once. The sheer vitriol we spewed at each other was even uglier than what we imagined might be aimed our way from the stars. We fractured along every possible line, religious, national, economic, turns out, all it took was one glance at a threat beyond our comprehension to turn humanity against itself. I spent the next few weeks on autopilot. Turns out, even the potential end of the world doesn't absolve you from paperwork. Debriefs, psychological evaluations, which, frankly, should have gone both ways, the never-ending media circus that transformed us overnight from scientists to prophets. All I wanted was to crawl into a hole and forget that, somewhere above my head, there was a monstrosity of metal and intent hanging in the void. It was Dr. Mishra, bless her pragmatic soul, who finally snapped me out of it. She found me in the outpost makeshift rec room, staring blankly at a rerun of some ancient sitcom that felt like a relic beamed back from a simpler time. You want answers, Camden. You won't find them re-watching friends. She plopped herself on the worn couch beside me, her eyes bright beneath the two harsh fluorescent lights. And where else am I supposed to look, Indira? My voice sounded flat even to my own ears. We're sitting ducks out here. All they have to do is flick that cosmic light switch off again, and it's over. Could be. She shrugged, the motion belying the tension in her shoulders. Could also be this is a one-off. Drive-by sightseeing from aboard alien civilization, the kind that makes those crop circles and gets bored quickly. Or it's a prelude. The words were bitter in my mouth. That eclipse wasn't a coincidence, and we both know it. Things like that. They have purpose. Dr. Mishra hummed, a low note that reverberated in the too quiet room. Maybe. Or maybe we're assigning a motive where there is none. We humans, we have a nasty habit of making patterns where they might not exist. Assuming everything is a chess game because that's the only game we know how to play. My mind snagged on her words. It was a chilling thought, that perhaps what was out there defied our petty understandings of strategy and domination. That we were, for them, nothing more than curious ants scurrying around with plans and schemes that might never register on their radar. So, what do we do? I asked. The question echoed in the silence. Mishra's response was a shrug, a scientist's helpless gesture in the face of the unknowable. Study the damn thing, I suppose. Learn all we can while we still have the chance. It ain't glamorous, and it might not save us if the worst happens. But sitting and feeling sorry for ourselves isn't an option, Camden. Not for you, not for anyone with a brain and a shred of curiosity left in them. That night, I dreamt of the eclipse. The impossible angles of the structure, the weight of eyes staring down. But when I jolted awake, heart pounding, it wasn't fear that coursed through me. Mishra's words lingered, sparked something reckless that I hadn't felt since I'd first volunteered for outpost duty on this desolate rock. They were out there, a force beyond our current reckoning, and running away wouldn't stop that. If answers were all we had left, I'd squeeze them out of the universe itself. The lunar outpost, in the wake of the incident, was transformed. The sleepy research station became a hub of frantic activity. Every telescope, every satellite we could wrangle was repurposed towards studying what we'd started morbidly calling the eye. That cold, clinical term made it easier to talk about, turned the unknowable into a dissected specimen pinned under a magnifying glass. We learned nothing, 
And we learned everything. Thermal scans showed the eye was colder than it had any right to be, sucking in the sun's warmth rather than reflecting it. Spectrometers spat out readings that made the chemists curse and run their simulations twice. The damn thing was made of materials that shouldn't exist according to our neat little periodic table. Then there were the windows. They flickered in complex patterns that no earthly code breaker could decipher. Were they communication attempts? Was this some sort of cosmic billboard advertising the grand opening of our celestial doom? We could theorize till we went hoarse, but answers seemed permanently out of reach. The longer we studied, the more I questioned Mishra's initial dismissal of the chess game scenario. There was a system at work here, an intricate design that made my heart clench cold with recognition. I'd mapped enough asteroid fields to know when patterns were more than random chance. The eye, for all its inscrutability, was a clock, counting down to something. That something remained frustratingly out of reach. We'd picked up odd electromagnetic bursts from the far side of the moon before, dismissed them as lingering effects of some past cosmic event. Now, when overlaid with the eye's activation dates, a grim correlation started to emerge. If the pattern held true, well, let's just say the human race didn't have a whole lot of retirement planning to worry about. Mishra, when I presented my findings, didn't bat an eye. She simply asked, and what do you propose we do with this revelation, Camden? It was the question I'd been dreading. The easy answer was to go public, spill the doomsday calculations, let the world burn itself out in a final blaze of panic before the real fire show began. The nobler, foolhardy part of me, the part that chose this godforsaken tin can of a life, clawed for an alternative. We take the fight to them. It felt like a line from some bad action movie when it left my lips, but there was a steely core to it. Look, we're outmatched, hopelessly so. But they haven't just swatted us aside yet. That buys us time, and time is a resource if you know how to weaponize it. Weaponize it, Mishra repeated, her gaze thoughtful. How, precisely? We have glorified mining lasers and probes built for analyzing dust bunnies. It's not about the hardware. I paced the cramped lab, feeling the restless energy crackle in my veins. We need a shift of mentality. Stop thinking like explorers, start thinking like cornered rats. Because we are cornered, and the only way out might be to bite hard enough to surprise our captor. Outpost 4 was never built for war. But in the months following my outburst, that's exactly what it became. Mishra, with surprising efficiency, rallied support among the scientists, engineers, and communications experts who'd found themselves on the front line without ever enlisting. Turns out, those suited for a life among the stars were also frighteningly adaptable when faced with extinction. We reverse-engineered probes, cannibalizing parts for projects far removed from their intended purpose. Mining lasers were retooled into clumsy blasters, satellite dishes repurposed to beam out pulses of what we hoped were sufficiently disruptive frequencies. The rec room, with its sad treadmill and dusty protein dispensers, transformed into a war room filled with holographic projections, trajectories plotted with desperate precision. All the while, the eye loomed overhead, a constant reminder of the countdown ticking away. It began to warp our perception of time. Days melted into endless prep cycles, punctuated by moments of searing terror when we thought we'd picked up changes in the eye's behavior. Nights were for strategy sessions lit by flickering emergency lights, the shared exhaustion a stronger bond than any team-building exercise. The hardest part, strangely enough, was convincing Earth. The politicians, the military brass. They were still stuck on old-world notions of defense. They wanted us to bunker down, conserve supplies, pray that whatever occupied that monstrosity overlooking us would lose interest and move on. When briefings about repurposed solar panels and jury rig disruptor beams were met with stony silence, we knew we were on our own. Then again, on our own had been the unofficial motto of this outpost since its inception. D-Day, as we morbidly dubbed it, was calculated down to the minute. It wasn't some dramatic intercept mission straight out of the movies. We knew the second we powered up those cobbled together weapons, the I would notice. It was a suicide mission disguised as a leap of faith, based on a hunch that whatever waited on the other side might value surprise over raw power. I was strapped into a reinforced shuttle, the kind normally used for ferrying or samples. Now it was packed with our hastily assembled arsenal and piloted by Lieutenant Jang, a former asteroid prospector whose hands proved steadier than those of any seasoned fighter pilot in the face of potential oblivion. Our flight path was a desperate gamble, mapped out from blurry scans and educated guesses about the potential blind spots the eye might have. Takeoff was a jarring anti-climax, none of the trembling ascent I'd grown accustomed to on long-haul rockets. Just a quick jolt and then the vast, unforgiving blackness of space broken only by the cold gleam of the moon's surface below. 
that's when it happened. Not a counterattack, not the blinding flash of our annihilation I'd half expected. Instead, a ripple went through the eye. Its perfectly geometric structure warped, shifted. Then sections seemed to fold in on themselves, shrinking like a collapsing star. We watched, transfixed, as the gargantuan base that had haunted our skies imploded, disappearing into the void in eerie silence. Lieutenant Jang swore and slammed his fist against the console. We did it, damn it. All that scrambling, and we didn't even need to fire a shot. His bravado was premature. The moment the last glint of the eye vanished, a shockwave swept over our tiny shuttle. Not a blast of energy, but something stranger, a ripple of wrongness that warped the very fabric of space around us. Our instruments went haywire, the stars smearing and twisting, and then... nothing. I awoke, if you could call it that, to a sensation of falling. Not the plummeting of a ship losing control, but a bone-deep shift of my entire being, as though gravity itself had tilted on its axis. Opening my eyes was an exercise in futility. There was no light, no darkness, just an unsettling awareness of vast, empty space stretching out in every direction. Jang? I called out into the void, my voice sounding thin and alien. There was no response. No hum of equipment, no steady beep of life support. Nothing. Panic flared, then fizzled. It felt pointless, fear as useless a weapon here as our repurposed lasers. I closed my eyes, and then, in the boundless expanse of that place, I saw it. Not an image, not in any sense I could comprehend. It was a flicker of intent, a cold, curious intelligence touching the edges of my own. And with it came a certainty, clear as any equation I'd ever balanced, we weren't alone. The eye, it seemed, wasn't just a structure. It was a doorway. And by collapsing it, we'd done the intergalactic equivalent of kicking down the front door of the most reclusive, and potentially dangerous, neighbor in the cosmos. We'd gone looking for answers, and now, those answers were hurtling towards us from some unknown corner of existence. Whether they came bearing gifts, or something far darker, remained to be seen. All those years peering across the cosmos, wondering what lurked in the shadows. Turns out, the shadows had eyes of their own. And, for better or worse, humanity was now squarely fixed in their gaze. Survival, faced with such a monumental shift, became a matter of redefining existence entirely. Time ceased to have meaning in the conventional sense. There was no sun to mark days, no familiar constellations to orient by. My only point of reference was my shuttle, a metal speck clinging precariously to a shard of reality that seemed ready to shatter at any moment. My body, too, rebelled. Hunger and thirst became distant echoes, replaced by an ache that ran deeper than mere biology. It was a primal disorientation, the sense of something fundamental unhooking within me. Astronaut training had prepared me for the physical toll of space, but not this metaphysical unraveling. Alone in the endless non-space, I found myself clinging to the shreds of my old life. I recited planetary mnemonics like a prayer to a forgotten god, ran diagnostics on systems that served no purpose, even attempted to rewire the comm systems, a desperate act of faith in a signal that might never be heard. It was during one of those frantic bursts of activity that I discovered the shift wasn't absolute. My vision, or whatever replaced it in this warped reality, had begun to flicker, catching fragments of other scenes. It was disjointed, a glimpse of a planet teeming with bioluminescent life, a vast geometric cityscape that made the eye seem like a child's crude drawing, then a flash of something monstrous, segmented and writhing in the depths of a gas giant. At first, I dismissed them as hallucinations born of isolation. But with each passing non-day, the pattern was undeniable. These were glimpses of other corners of the cosmos, places the eye, whatever it truly was, held a connection to. Was this an accidental side effect of its implosion, or a deliberate breadcrumb trail laid by an intelligence vaster than my own? The question seared through my disorientation. We'd stumbled into this interdimensional limbo not through any act of daring, but by sheer, dumb luck. Now, it seemed, there were unseen forces at play. Forces that were shaping the very fabric of this place, nudging me, guiding me. Towards a destination unknown. Fear prickled my spine anew. It wasn't the fear of annihilation, that seemed too mundane now. This was an existential terror, the realization that the cosmic game had changed, and the rules were still being written. But so had my understanding. My space dock reflexes kicked in, document, analyze, find the patterns even in chaos. That insatiable curiosity, what had first led me to the stars, was still a flicker within. I turned my attention not outwards, but to the fragments of reality my warped senses brought forth. The flickering visions intensified, 
some stabilizing long enough for me to latch onto details, the thrum of energy underlying a world of crystalline spires, the delicate interplay of radiation belts circling a pulsating star. It was a language, not of words or code, but of fundamental principles woven into the fabric of existence itself. Each scene became a puzzle, a problem to solve with senses I didn't fully possess yet. In the quiet desperation of that metal shell, I began to attune myself to the undercurrents of this new reality. Navigation had never been my forte, but there was a flow to that impossible void, a rhythm to the disorienting sensory impressions. If I focused, really focused, I found I could will myself to shift, pulled like a needle aligning to a strange sort of magnetic north. Exhaustion blurred the line between desperation and something like meditation. And the pieces clicked into place. The I hadn't been a base, not really. It was a node, a nexus point in a network stretching across dimensions I couldn't fathom. Its destruction hadn't severed those connections, it had scattered me across them. My shuttle, my body, those were just anchors, a tether to a single, safe point of reference. The real journey, it seemed, had to be done with a different sort of compass. I closed my eyes, focused on the hum of a distant pulsar, its rhythm mirrored in my own frantic heartbeat. I let go. Not in surrender, but in terrifying acceptance of this new, broken reality. With a jolt that felt as much mental as physical, I shifted. Gone was the comforting enclosure of the shuttle. I was surrounded, subsumed, by a world of pulsating light, every sensory input a symphony of vibrations rather than sights and sounds. Creatures like vast, iridescent clouds moved with ponderous grace, leaving trails that shimmered with equations and intent. It was overwhelming, but also oddly familiar, a cosmic echo of the diagrams and formulas that had been my bread and butter back on the outpost. Here theory became existence, raw and undeniable. I was adrift, but not aimlessly. There was a directionality to this place, a flow that drew me ever onwards. And then, rising above the cosmic landscape, was a nexus. Not metal and glass, but a convergence of shimmering strands, a knot of impossible complexity that throbbed with a familiar, dangerous energy. We'd found the source. Not a species, not a conqueror, but the architect of that vast interdimensional network we'd inadvertently crashed into. Whether I was a trespasser or a pawn in some grand scheme remained unknown but in that place where stars were born and swallowed again, I'd find the answer.